My name is Gunil Spies and um, I was married to Fritz for almost 50 years and after he passed away uh, the film industry felt that all the things which he had kept and he was a, a stickler for keeping everything um, should be put together in an archive. And um, the last eight years um, after we hired an archivist, I've spent a lot of time um, helping to make that idea a reality. Um, the um, interview of me is taken in the William F. White building, which uh, has now a clubhouse for the CSC, which is something I think all CSC members from the beginning had dreamt about. And um, so in this building, um, Fritz's stuff, if you want to call it that way, um, was housed and uh, they gave us the freedom to um, go through it. We could use the boardroom or the client lounge and uh, just do our thing. All Fritz's material has now been donated to the U of T media um, archive and um, it is a very good place for all the things there. So when Joan asked me to um, come for an interview or talk about my experiences um, um, in my life with Fritz, um, I thought maybe I should get some um, things relating to the CSC out of the archive. So I brought a little suitcase and uh, went through the, all the stuff Fritz had kept for the, from the CSC. I went through it yesterday and it was like deja vu, names I hadn't heard of for a long time and you know everything was just really right there, those early days in the 50s when we were all um, young and enthusiastic and things were happening and people had ideas how to fashion things and uh, I was at a at a, a gala evening for Cecilia Franca and you know she of course started in 1951 and that's when we came as well and you know when they sh uh, showed shots of Toronto at that time it just like I've had a really deja vu for the last couple of days. So um, I think Joan asked me to um, speak a little bit about how I met Fritz and our first years in Canada. Um, Fritz and I knew each other for a long, long time before we came to Canada. He um, and my brother attended um, a very prestigious uh, school in Leipzig and they were both members of the famous St. Thomas Choir. Um, the life in the St. Thomas Choir meant that um, you had to be a very good student because there was Latin and Greek and math and physics, you had to know all that, but also you had to devote two hours each day uh, for practicing choral works and then there were concerts Saturdays and Sundays and Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. So um, it was a very intense um, schooling they had. And um, uh, this of course was all during the um, uh, uh, late 30s and 40s when they were at school. And during that time the choir was threatened to be dissolved. And so Fritz at the age of 16 did his very first movie. He comes from a long line of photographers. His grandfather was already a photographer. His father uh, was a photographer. His older brother was a photographer. And uh, Fritz always had the dream because his brother would inherit the photo store that he would um, become a cinematographer. That was his dream from way back when. Of course, you can have dreams, but they don't always materialize. The end of the war came. His father and brother were killed in the war. Um, he um, 
escaped the um, Soviet zone, which Leipzig uh, was in, and um, went to the British zone to work for a former apprentice of his father to get his photography um, apprenticeship done. Now, this particular little city was located in the Canadian Army occupation, which was part of the British zone. And Fritz always told the story how many Canadians he had met and um, uh, taking pictures uh, of them. And he, his biggest hope was, when we were in Canada, that he would once meet one of these soldiers. He, he just said, Canadians were just so different. They were just so different from any other occupation army. So uh, that played a big role in our decision to um, apply for Canadian citizenship. Okay, so, um, so he was in the British zone, but then he wanted to um, uh, take the um, further apprenticeship with a very famous German portrait photographer, like the equivalent of Kosh. And through her, of course, he knew about Kosh. And, um, and we also knew about Norman McLean. Those were the only two Canadians we knew anything about, okay? So, um, which is quite interesting. And uh, so he uh, apprenticed with her, and she was, she was bombed out in Berlin and had her studio in Heidelberg, which is where we had um, fled to because my grandparents uh, lived there. So um, he found out that um, my brother's family was there, so he uh, came and of course there was no, it, it was very difficult to find anywhere to live. So my parents took him in and um, he lived with us from 1946 till 1951, except for the one year when he went to photo school to get his master's in photography. And that was in Munich. And um, so by 1949, both Fritz and I, we had our own um, um, business. Fritz had his photo business and uh, big clients, uh, Heidelberg Press, um, you know, really a wonderful beginning of a career. And I had my dressmaking studio and, but then when we heard that Canada would take immigrants without a sponsor. That was the big thing after the war. The United States needed sponsors, Australia needed sponsors. Well, Canada had um, opened its doors and you could apply. So we did apply and we knew absolutely nothing about Canada. We knew there were three cities, Montreal, um, Vancouver and Ottawa. That was all. Toronto we hadn't even heard about. And um, so we went for our interview and uh, that was all fine. He said, where would you like to go? Oh, Fritz piped up and said, I want to go to Ottawa. Oh, why do you want to go to Ottawa? And of course, Fritz had his uh, portfolio with all his photographs, you know. And Fritz said, um, because Akash lives there. And so I can still see this immigration officer sort of thing. Oh, you want to give him competition? And Fritz didn't know the word competition. He said, yes. He thought yes was all right. I nearly fell under the table. But um, the immigration officer uh, thought that was really rather funny and said, no, I, I would like you to go to Toronto because you do all these industrial photographs as well as portraits. Now, I should say Fritz thought not to give him competition, he wanted to retouch for him because Fritz was a fantastic retoucher, like unbelievable. He could make any girl look beautiful by just retouching the photograph. So anyway, <coughs> so this is how we came to Toronto. So we came to, to Toronto in 1951 and um, didn't really have much difficulty. We had a job. We couldn't take any money, so we came really with ten dollars. And uh, but Fritz had his equipment. And I had my sewing machine, so you know we thought this. And and we thought, you know, if people ask me why did you come to Canada, really the reason was we wanted to um, see what the rest of the world 
was like and you know money for traveling and that was just unheard of you know I mean you worked hard and you know you just were above um, the water so uh, we thought okay we can always I'm sure we can always make enough money to um, buy um, um, and this was boat trips at the time not plane trips uh, buy a boat trip back but um, <coughs> that uh, um, idea never never occurred to us after we came. So Fritz had a recommendation from the Heidelberg Printing Press to their office here. Um, that man was delighted to get a, a, a personal letter from the head honcho of the Heidelberg Press and proceeded to take us to the old mill for lunch on the first day when after we arrived in Canada. And I think <laughs> that was pretty nice. And so um, uh, Fritz found a, um, a job at Panda Photography, that was the foremost photographic studio in Toronto. And um, he worked with Panda for uh, 1951 till 1950, late 53, early 54. Which is of course where, when the CBC had started. <coughs> But while he was at Panda, he um, um, okay. While he was at Panda, Panda was approached by one of a society woman who felt she wanted to do something for children with cerebral palsy, and she had bought a Bolex and said uh, to the owners of Panda, "Do you have anybody who would like to make a film?" about these children so that I can use this film and go around and show people what these children and hope to raise some money. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, um, the owners of Panda said, um, is anybody interested? And Fritz of course, yeah, 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 you know. Oh, finally a chance to be behind a camera. So finally he um, could be behind a movie camera and he just went for it and uh, did a lovely film. A friend of ours helped him with uh, the music. And the film is called Don't Hurry Past. We still have a copy in the archive. And um, this film, of course, had to be developed and, you know, finished and, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, Fritz got a phone call from S.W. Colwell who had just started a, um, a um, what do you call it, uh, a commercial studio, yeah. And uh, <coughs> he wanted to make commercials because the CBC had started, as I said, and he needed a cameraman. And the reason Fritz got the call was that the people who developed the film, like the, the, the what is it called? The, the, the lab, the lab had seen the film and they said, oh, well, phone this Fred Spies, we've seen his stuff, he knows what he's doing. Okay, so big discussion between Fritz and myself. Well, I'm just, you know, starting to really, you know, get a track with the photo um, thing and should I really, and I said, Fritz, we haven't got children, I've got a job if this TV uh, commercial business isn't, uh, film commercial business isn't working, you can always go back to the photography, you've already made a name for yourself. But I said, as long as I know you, you wanted to be a cameraman, this is your chance. Take it. Okay. So we lived on Bloor Street where uh, the um, Castle Frank station is, that was the house where we lived and it's gone now. So he could walk down to S.W. Caldwell and I worked on Bloor Street. I could walk to Bloor Street. We didn't have a car. And um, so he started there. And I think in the first two months, people kind of thought, what's with this guy? He has to ask so many questions. You know, because he, you know, all the, the movie equipment, I mean, he hadn't seen 
you know, he had a little eight millimeter at home and, and the Bolex, that was his experience as far as I So he had to ask a lot of questions and he said, you know, people were really wondering what is with this guy. But after they saw <laughs> what he was producing, because as everybody in cinematography knows, it's all in the lighting. It's not the machines, it's whether you know how to light and that he certainly could. So um, that was his stepping into being a cinematographer. And of course, as we all know, he hasn't looked back and you know, everybody knows about him. So he worked at SW Caldwell for four years, I believe. Um, yeah, because I can also tell by the political events, then the Hungarians came in 57, so they were Hungarians, uh, their director, and uh, well, the, the, the now pretty well-known Bob Schultz worked at I.S.W. Caldwell's in the lab, you know, I mean, everybody started just on the lower rung. So, um, yeah, he worked there until 58, and then he was approached by, by um, Robert Lawrence Productions. Robert Lawrence was, um, had a studio in the States, and he wanted to branch out to Canada, and uh, so he established this uh, Robert Lawrence uh, Productions, which was a very nice studio. It's, of course, now a parking lot somewhere in Yorkville. And, um, so he started there in 58, and this is when um, commercials really came into their own, you know, like Mexico trip, um, the beer commercial where the guy uh, dives and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It, it was, you know, a totally expanding universe, shall we say, as far as, you know, productions were concerned. He was very busy. But that was also the time when the CSC was started. And, um, <coughs> of course, people know about uh, Jackson Samuels and Herb Albert and all these people, but Fritz and Bob Brooks came in very, very, very much on the, you know, very ground of it. And, you know, I was thinking about um, how memory works while I was having this deja vu yesterday looking through all these files. And I could have sworn that the CSC was started on our big living room table. We have a very small house, but our uh, living room table can be made very big, and so 15 people can sit around and talk and do whatever. Now, uh, according to um, some of the stuff I've read, I think uh, the very original um, meeting must have taken place at Meridian, and because this is where Herb Albert and uh, Sammy worked. So my, my recollection, I still have my recollection though, even though it might not be correct, because I, uh, the meeting I remember was, <coughs> must have been on the Saturday because I was working during the week and I was making coffee and, you know, giving them little cookies or whatever. And one of the people from Montreal um, said, now, isn't this a nice beginning? And I think we're going to have really nice um, yearly meetings where the wives can come. And one meeting is in Toronto and one meeting is in Montreal. And, you know, we are going to have a dinner and dance. And wouldn't it be nice? And wouldn't it be nice? He kept sort of turning. So I think that's why I remember. <coughs> but it uh, obviously wasn't the very first meeting, but it was a first meeting anyway, you know. So, um, so we are 1957, and I found uh, you wanted to know an exact date, and um, it, uh, Fritz didn't have his little time calendars where he wrote anything in at that time. They came later. We looked at the archive, but I found one piece of paper where it says September 57, so I would think that 
one of the I mean you start with a meeting but before that I'm sure there were telephone conversations and ten conversations on the say what do you think shall we have you know that sort of thing so I think September 57 sounds like a a good date you know so when we celebrate the 50th um, anniversary of the CAC I think um, we are okay to say that it started in 50 57 and then very soon very soon we um, um, no that was another one um, no this is a later one one of these uh, CSC newsletters this is a later one the first one I think is August 58 so that's you know really shows that these guys hustled with getting this whole thing on the on on the show the show on the road so um i was even surprised to find that we have newsletters which are that old may 1958 i i was thinking before it was september may 1958 i mean this is totally amazing that was the first and you see they have a um roster of membership as of April 6, 1958. So they have the, the membership there. But it's also that first um, um, magazine is also interesting because um, somebody makes a speech and compares uh, the uh, qualification of a family physician um, and how much time he has to spend going to school and learning things. And he says, we have to show the world that we are just as professional as um, a family physician. So this is the very first article in, um, in their magazine. And then um, this is, uh, no, I'll go this way. This is June 59 and you see, at that time, they still had Montreal and, um, and Ottawa chapters. So um, here's a very nice article by Bob Brooks, who was president in 1951, 1959. So um, this is archivally very, very important and interesting. Um, so th this is a shot of um, all the members all the members going to a very interesting talk by one gentleman at the first annual convention in um, in Montreal. Now here, this is May 1960, um, Bob Brooks shakes hands with Fritz Spies, who um, is now the president. Bob Brooks was in 1960 and Oh, I still remember this trip to Montreal in Bob's car. I think we were about six people in the car because, you know, nobody had money, you know. I mean, you just had to make ends meet. And somewhere in there is how much the dinner cost, I think six dollars or something like that. So, you know, this... The red one. Yeah. So these were the um, old first magazines, and then by November 1961, I mean, this is, it's really quite amazing. Uh, by November 61, they had their first really good magazine out. They contracted some person who was an editor, and this is November 1961. I mean, this is totally impressive. Um, what is, is this the one with the... Art Benson. Um, yeah, this is the Art Benson, um, you know, effort. And he did it for quite a while. These early enthusiasts um, were very, very concerned that um, the whole idea of the CSC would be patterned after the um, British um, Association and the ASC in, in the States. And, and they ran into a bit of a problem with the um, 
Oh, what, what is it? The, the, the government body which grants the, uh, the um, what is it? The grants? The charter, yeah. So um, he was mostly Bob Brooks and Fritz who spent hours and hours and hours going, trying to, um, to fashion uh, the, this constitution so that they could send it in to have it, the, the charter granted. And um, I always thought Fritz could have been a very good lawyer because he is so um, concerned about details, okay, and nothing escapes him. And um, I think um, people could and should be surprised that in this early document of the uh, Constitution, he had a provision that it is uh, very clear that male or female persons could be becoming cinematographers. And you know, this was not the time, um, you know, where even the, the term of political correctness was, uh, was uh, in vogue. So um, I think he can be commended uh, for that. But I mean, the many drafts um, these people did for this constitution was just amazing. But then they got a lawyer and, um, and apparently at one of the conventions, they, um, Bob Brooks could announce that he had just gotten a, a, ter a telegram saying that the charter is, is granted. Um, so I, I think that was quite amazing. Of course, constitution can be amended, but I think they uh, were cognizant of the fact that you put the original constitution in such a fashion that it isn't difficult to amend it, but not that everybody can amend the constitution all the time. So, you know, I thought that was really interesting. Both Bob and uh, Fritz and Sammy uh, really needed then to, um, you know, do their thing and not spend that much time <laughs> on the on the CSC. And uh, there was then Don Wilder and um, I don't know the other presidents, but it's all documented. And um, so we were coming along quite nicely, alternating between Toronto and Montreal. But now we are in the 60s. And um, the Quebec people were not that interested in being associated with the association which was coming out of English Canada. And that was very, very noticeable. Um, and, you know, to me it was interesting how the political um, uh, milieu, uh, you know, culminating in, in um, uh, de Gaulle's uh, statement at the Expo, um, was detrimental to having an all Canadian, French and English uh, thing. I mean, at first these uh, French Canadian uh, people were very enthusiastic, but I think they were under a lot of pressure to uh, and not be involved with uh, this part of the CSC. Okay. So by that time we are uh, coming around to 1965, which um, uh, Fritz got um, um, hired by the Walt Disney um, uh, people together with, um, what was the director, Bob? Barclay. No, no, Bob Barclay. Uh, Disney wanted uh, Canadian people to work on this, uh, on this project and, um, and he got them all down to Hollywood and explained to them what he wanted. And one of the stipulations was always told me, say, no sex and no violence. Okay, so fine. Uh, <clears throat> the whole thing was shot from a, a World War II bomber, uh, which had nine cameras. And, uh, you know, the cameraman had to lie on his stomach in order to get this all going. George Morita was his assistant. And uh, Fritz always said, I don't think anybody has seen Canada the way I have. He has seen it from the air. He's seen it from trains, like they went through Canada from car. Uh, it was just amazing. Some of it was dangerous, like the, the flight uh, through the Fraser Valley. He thought that was 
you know, was his end, okay? But they survived and the film was a huge success. There were long lines um, and, you know, if you ask people who were small kids, nowadays if I ask them, you know, did you go to Montreal to expo, did you see the, the film? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. So that uh, was a wonderful experience um, um, for him uh, to do that. And um, what else? Uh, at that time, he worked closely with uh, Professor Edmund Carpenter, who was a foremost uh, um, anthropologist. And he wanted uh, to make a film about the very, not the Eskimo um, sculptures which we see now. He wanted to show these, you know, two centimeters high carved uh, um, uh, sculptures which are 1,000, 10,000 years old. And Fritz used a lot of his spare time to uh, photograph these. Unfortunately, we are just trying to um, see where that copy, it was never finished because the money ran out and Fritz didn't have time anymore and so on and so forth. But we are trying to get this uh, film and I talked to um, Ted Carpenter the other day and he said, hey, I gave it to the Museum of Anthropology and they should have it, but we haven't been successful in finding it. But anyway, so just to give you an idea, but otherwise it was commercials, 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 and uh, he traveled all over the world. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's really down now the, the late 60s, uh, 70s was just filled with commercials. I found, uh, while I was going through these piles of things from the archive, Fritz had these little um, cards and he always had them in his breast pocket. And if he thought of something, he would write it down. And I found one. And actually, I found quite a lot with Don Angus. I have to tell Don Angus means that, you know. I should show that to Don sometime. Um, and so it says, when I, after, he, he sort of says this, after I had fled uh, the Russian zone, I came back to Leipzig for the trade fair. You could then travel to the trade fair in 47, 48. And I realized how drab, I mean, everything was drab in Germany after the war, but there was a big difference which zones had come out of the drabness at least a little bit and which were still stuck. So what he's saying is it was very clear to me that without advertising um, in a society which doesn't have a market economy, there is a lot of drabness and uh, you know I thought this in, in I had never heard him say it in so many words but I found this an interesting observation how he um, really didn't feel this was a second class thing what he was doing he also compared it um, you know 30 second or one minute commercial he compared it to a sonnet and um, he um, he felt you have to express something in that short a time and you can do it with lighting, but you know, a lot of thought has to go in. I've already mentioned his little index cards, which he always had with him. And I should say, I have a carton <coughs> that big. There must be at least 2,000 index cards with little scribbles on them. Things he wanted to remember things he, um, like the one I found the other day about, uh, or found yesterday about this, uh, why advertising in the Soviet zone was uh, non-existent and how drab it was. So he had these index cards. <coughs> Everybody knew that whatever he saved, articles or pictures or whatever, he put in glossing envelopes. And um, so that was another trademark. I mean, if I show somebody a glossing uh, envelope, they know. This is fr anybody who has known Fritz, the, the connection is there right away. So that's a glossing. And then his, um, and you know, this is interesting. These <coughs> little yellow stickers, they are not that 
you didn't have them that long ago. I think it's not more than 20 years that these came up, but Fritz just took to them. I mean, <laughs> whatever book I open, there's always a little yellow sticker with a little note why this is in there. Now, Gerd Kurtz was, um, and, and came from Germany. He was quite a bit younger than, than Fritz. And he started a um, camera repair um, outfit. And Fritz knew exactly who to trust his cameras with, who was a good person to, you know, I don't know where Gerd um, took his training, but it, it was top, okay? So <coughs> Fritz was so happy to find Gerd. And, um, <clears throat> and and they, you know, made little improvements which then only would be on his cameras and all this kind of thing. I mean, they had a ball figuring this all out together. So, um, Gert let Fritz know that he is now um, uh, opening his own. He, he was working for some outfit. I don't remember what. But Fritz found Gerd and found his capabilities. So Gerd opened his own um, shop or whatever, what do you call it? His own enterprise. Uh, and what is it called? P precision. P precision camera. Precision camera. So he let Fritz know, I'm, and it's the perfect word for both Fritz and Gerd. Precision, yes, that's what it is. Okay, so Fritz shows up at, and this is how Gerd tells the story. Fritz shows up at, uh, makes an appointment. I need um, six or seven of, or ten of my cameras checked. And makes an appointment, okay, it comes with his cameras, it takes the, you know, somebody takes the cameras in, and... Um, and Fritz said, uh, you know, can I have them back in a couple of days? And, um, and Gerd looks at one of the cameras. He said, it needs n really nothing or not very much. Doesn't matter, Fritz said. Um, and here's a check for $1,000. Gerd said, Fritz, uh, it, <laughs> it doesn't need that much work. I've seen these cameras. I've checked. Fritz said, Gerd, I've started my own business long time ago, and I know how important it is to have cash flow. Here's a thousand dollars you put in the bank and you can repair my cameras until the thousand dollars are gone, but I don't need the thousand dollars as badly as you need them now. Well, I mean, it just, Gerd would never forget it and uh, the friendship which was existing before because of their interest in, um, in good work. Okay, um, but it was cemented with a thousand dollar check. The CSC was very good in um, very early on um, establishing awards. And um, the, the one which comes to mind is the Roy Tash Award. And I thought, and I read somewhere that Roy Tash was not too, he was not one of the early ones and uh, to join because of he thought it would conflict with his job. But once he joined, and he was the treasurer for I don't know how many years, at least 10 or 15. And he was a wonderful old gentleman. And he came to all the dinners with his wife. And they were the biggest dancers. And you know, it was just wonderful. So the CSC decided to um, establish a news, newsreel award in the name of Roy Tash. So I think that was really kind of wonderful thing. So. I don't know about the other one was for cinematography and so on and so forth. And in, in the early days, it was this long lens. And Fritz, I think, has a couple of those. Now you have this, you know, uh, other uh, sculpture. But then um, outside of the CSC, uh, there is an organization which is called the... Um, hmm, they give out the Bessies. What is it called? 
Um, television and radio broadcast association, huge association. And somebody in 1979 had the idea uh, to recognize Fritz's work. And um, his name was Doug Linden, or still is Doug Linden. He was a, in an advertising agency, and Fritz had done work for him. Uh, but he thought it would be kind of fun to ask Fritz to put together um, a reel of commercials for the last 25 years, ever since he had started. And it's a very interesting reel. We have it in the, in the archive because, you know, in, in 1950, um, um, well, whenever he started in 50, whatever, um, his commercials were so slow you know, very, very slow, drawn out, you know. And so Fritz put together this reel, one commercial for each year. Okay. So, um, and the whole family made decisions, which, you know, I mean, he had about 15 commercials for each year, so it was difficult to choose the one which uh, would make it relevant. So anyway, these, uh, this television, television bureau, I think it's called, is the association. And they, um, they then showed at their annual get-together where 2,000 people come from all advertising aspects. That nothing just to do with cinematography. They all um, saw this. Um, Doug Linton introduced, now you're going to see the work of somebody um, and um, what he has done in the last 25 years. So it started and people, <laughs> people were sitting in the audience and, and people would sort of say, what is this? You know, it's so slow. I mean, by that time, 79, <laughs> ultra bright, you know, it was just going crazy. And so by the time about the fifth commercial, fifth or sixth commercial, we heard whispering in the back, that's Fritz's stuff, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, they, it was quite an occasion. And they gave him what is now known as the Fritz Spies Award. And this award is given annually not only to some, some cinematographers have gotten it, but it's giving to somebody who is writing music, who is writing commercials, who is a big uh, advertising executive, somebody who is doing something worthwhile, good for the industry. So this, of course, is quite an honor if an award which is given out yearly is named after a person. So that's the, the one award. and. Um, Fritz didn't have, it's a beautiful sculpture, uh, the award, which is given out each year. But Fritz didn't have it for the longest time. He just had a piece of paper, this is the Fritz Bees Award. So um, after Fritz had passed away, I was contacted by the um, television bureau and said, um, would I like to have now a real Spies Award? So I, of course, said that would be very nice. And when we had the display at William F. White, you know, it was always displayed there. Amongst the other, uh, the other awards, um, there is also um, the Kodak New Century Award, which was started, well, Fritz died in 98, must have been the early 90s. And Fritz was the first recipient of that. It has now, uh, I think, about 20 recipients. So that was a great honor as well. Well, Fritz's relationship with Kodak, um, of course, goes back a long time because he um, questioned Kodak's wisdom. <laughs> I'm sure he has told everybody that story. And uh, they thought he didn't know what he was talking about, and he knew that he knew what he was talking about, okay? So this fight with Kodak went on for, I'm sure, I'm, at least in my memory, <laughs> it seems it went on for 10 years, that Fritz said, we need this kind of stock, and um, they said, no, you don't need it. And Fritz at one time <laughs> said to me, I think on my gravestone um, it should read, here lies the man who fought the almighty Kodak. <laughs> but uh, Colin Davis, when he came on board at Kodak, had apparently heard about this and 
Kodak had to apologize. It, it, Fritz was right. That's why that stock then came in, because other people, I mean, Fritz had rallied other people saying, this is ridiculous, why don't we have this stock? So finally they got the stock, and then Colin Davis uh, said that he would drive us to Rochester, Fritz and me, and Kodak would um, give him the grand tour uh, to sort of... Um, you know, give him the credit he, he deserves or whatever. So that's um, our long friendship with Colin Davis goes back that far. Thinking back uh, to Leipzig and um, Jim just uh, told me that he took a picture of the St. Thomas Church and showed it to Fritz and Fritz said to him, this was my church, this is where I sang every week. Um, I just wanted to say that neither Fritz nor I ever, ever thought that the wall would come down. That was so permanent. And um, on the day when it came down at 6 o'clock, I was taking care of my grandchildren, was cooking supper, and Carl phoned me. He says, Mom, put the TV on. The wall just came down. I said, Carl. I really haven't got time for jokes, okay? I'm busy here. Mom, put the TV on. The wall is coming down. I just thought, I, I can't believe this. And um, for us to go back, we went back right after the wall came down because, of course, uh, the Spies house is still there. And, you know, where I live, the house is still there. But, you know, this was uh, taken away or occupied by communists, our house, and Fritz tried to, or his mother tried to give their house away. So anyway, we wanted to see those houses again. And it, it was just a drab, drab, drab. This was 1990. And then um, we went back in 1995 uh, for a class reunion of Fritz's, and we were just going to stay for couple of days and then I realized I said to Fritz can we stay a few days longer because I realized how influential the city was in my upbringing in my outlook you know and um, it's a very cultured city you know I mean we had a wonderful opera wonderful theater um, and then, of course, the, the choir and the uh, Gewandhaus uh, Orchestra. And, I mean, it, it, I just realized, you know, after you leave your childhood environment under such political circumstances, you have to make a cut. Okay, this is the past and, you know, fine. But then you also don't realize how influential that was, you know. And... Um, you know, there are lots of aspects uh, uh, about uh, Leipzig, which I, you know, I could go on forever. But I said to Fritz, you know, I have to stay here for a couple more days. I have to just really, you know, figure out how much this city has been instrumental in how I think and so on and so forth. So that was, um, you know, really an amazing thing um, how this all, and of course, Leip and I've got to say this, and of course Leipzig was the um, catalyst for this whole wall coming down. Because in, not in the St. Thomas Church, in the other church where the choir also sang, the Nikolai Church, for weeks and months they held peace rallies, which of course the communists just hated. And out of these peace rallies in the St. Nikolai Church came these marches with the candles and the secret police trying to infiltrate and making it violent. And that these people managed to uh, keep, and of course, uh, Kurt Masur, the, the uh, conductor of the um, uh, Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, was very instrumental in, in keeping this um, energy at a level where it wouldn't, erupt. And um, so Leipzig is very, very instrumental that the, the ball eventually came down because people came from all over East Germany to take part in these, uh, in these demonstrations. 
And then finally, um, the government didn't dare to uh, forbid them or, you know. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing story and it needs really to, um, it, it makes me feel good that I come from the city where this has happened, you know. And then after Fritz passed away, uh, the CSC also named an award after him, and that is for, you know, the best television commercial. And, um, you know, that is, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's nice. It is, it's more than nice. It's very meaningful because, um, not because the awards are named after him, but this interest in his achievements and what he has done and how he has related to other people. <clears throat> it's wonderful for my grandchildren, I have five grandchildren, to, um, to have an, not only an image of their, but my older grandchildren knew him of course and loved him dearly. The younger ones were born after he um, had passed away and for them to sort of have concrete um, manifestations of um, of their grandfather is, is, is very wonderful. Just a little anecdote, uh, Jeffrey Fritz, uh, one of the twins, came home from school the other day and he said, my teacher asked me whether I am at all related to Fritz Spies and I said, yes, he was my grandfather. <laughs> So, I mean, it wasn't as apparently this woman had met him at, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter, but, you know, to sort of feel that, uh, you know, people knew about him. So I think that's um, sort of what I know about my husband's career.